Good evening. We will now call the order of the Finance Committee meeting for July the 20th, 2020. Item number one, please. Consider approval of Finance Committee minutes of July 6, 2020. After reviewing the minutes, are there any corrections or additions to our minutes? Move for approval. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve our minutes. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Tracy Hoos? Yes. Tracy McGee? Yes. Stephanie Morgan? Yes. Alex Reynolds? Yes. Evelyn Hibbs? Yes. Jamie Stout? Yes. Ivory Van? Yes. Deputy Mayor Derek Reed? Yes. Mayor Ma Marlon Coleman? Yes. Item number one passes. Item number two, please. Consider approval of claims for all city departments June 27, 2020 through July 10, 2020. Do we have a report from the Purchasing Committee? The purchase, Purchasing Committee did meet this afternoon and we approved the claims and I move for approval. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve our claims list. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Tracy Hoos? Yes. Tracy McGee? Yes. Stephanie Morgan? Yes. Alex Reynolds? Yes. Evelyn Hibbs? Yes. Jamie Stout? Yes. Ivory Van? Yes. Deputy Mayor Derek Reed? Yes. Mayor Marlon Coleman? Yes. Item number two passes. Item number three, please. Consider approval of a contract between the City of Muskogee and Hilldale Public Schools to furnish two uniformed officers to provide law enforcement security functions and act as the school resource officers for the school district campuses or take other necessary action. Mr. Garvin. Mr. Chair and members of the committee, this is a contract between the City of Muskogee and Hilldale Public Schools. If you recall, it's for two uniformed officers who will serve as the uh, resource officers for the city or for the Hilldale be one at each campus. The contract is for one year. It runs from July 1st, 2020 through June 30th, 2021. Hilldale will pay for 75% of the cost of the two officers. The city will pay 25% of the cost. Hilldale's share will be $116,548.88. The city's 25% is $38,849.63. The total cost for the two officers is $155,398.51. Copy of the contract is in your packet. Uh, both our parties are in agreement. I would recommend approval. And Mr. Puckett, the superintendent of Hilldale is present if you have any questions. Move for approval. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve this agenda item. Any discussion? Mr. Chair, I just want to say that I've had an opportunity to be at Hilldale several times and see those officers interact with those young people. And it is a tremendous effort uh, to see how they treat those officers almost like officer friendly. And I think in this environment in which we live, that's a big help to our community. So I salute uh, Dr. Puckett and his board for, for having this. All right. Roll call, please. Tracy Hoos? Yes. Tracy McGee? Yes. Stephanie Morgan? Yes. Alex Reynolds? Yes. Evelyn Hibbs? Yes. Jamie Stout? Yes. Ivory Van? Yes. Deputy Mayor Derek Reed? Yes. Mayor Marlon Coleman? Yes. Item number three passes. Item number four, please. Consider approval of the cooperative agreement between the City of Muskogee and Neighbors Building Neighborhoods for the purpose of applying for grants and grant activities on behalf of the city and other not-for-profit activities that enhance the economic well-being of the Muskogee community or take other necessary action. Mr. Garvin? This is the cooperative agreement between the City of Muskogee and Neighbors Building Neighborhoods. As the agenda item said, they will develop, apply and for grants on behalf of the city and other nonprofit uh, activities. The agreement is for 30,000. It is also a one year term, runs from July 1st, 2020 through Ju June 30th, 2021. A copy of the agreement along with their annual report and their budget was included in your packet. Uh, staff recommends approval and I'd ask Kim Lynch to come up and give a quick uh, report uh, on their activities. Thank you. So afternoon, Mr. Mayor and manager and counselors. Um, today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about neighbors building neighborhoods. Hopefully you looked at it on site and not in that lovely color. Um, but from our meager beginning with a weed and seed grant to the opening of the nonprofit work resource center, and now with all the programs and activities, NBN and the Nonprofit Resource Center is here to serve the community. Normally it's at April or in April when we do our annual meeting, I get to brag about our accomplishments, but that didn't happen this year. And we get to talk about exciting activities and events and projects and milestones we've reached. 
So you and, and my board get, are the, were the first to see the annual report, and it really is nice. If you go to our website, you can go through it and see. But really quickly, I want you to, um, I need to introduce a couple of board members, or past board members. Um, a past chair is Tish Callahan in the back. Past chair, I never know what to call him. <laughs> Dr. Mayor Pastor Marlon Coleman. <laughs> 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 and then I have some staff in attendance. Um, Mr. Dream Team over here, Derek Reed. And behind me is Lindsay Roberts, Julie Watson Ledbetter, and Mariah Kretcher. So those are a few of our staff here. Our, requ our request is the same as it's been in the past three years, which is $30,000. This is for proposal writing, grant research, and community involvement events and activities. I also included a handout for you. Kind of gives you, no one really knows what Neighbors Building Neighborhoods does. That's this little piece of paper that you see. So that gives you all of the, the programs, the back office work, our pass-through grants, our fiscal sponsor work, um, just as of 2020. So for the city of Muskogee, one of the things that you ask are how many dollars came to the city of Muskogee in grants. That's $790,390.40 $790, just in last year. For all grants that we received in 2019, that's 1,631,682. I've included a really condensed version of our budget. I find that really the easiest way to look at it. It just shows our fiscal agent fee, our membership services. I think you've all seen it in your packet. It's a real simple, short version. Um, one thing to note, that I talk about um, when you're looking at that. We always talk about the impact of the community and, and nonprofits engaged. If you'll look that last year, we had 126 individuals who received a W-2 wages from us, and that was $1,083,597.96. So we may not be a small little organization after all, but that's something, we don't brag a lot about ourselves. We like our work being shown, and so that's the reason why. I'll be glad to answer any questions you have. Mr. Chair, I think it's important to note um, that Neighbors Building Neighborhoods has always done more than what's in the contract. Um, that even though uh, we've had a slight increase from what they've been previously given, they've always done above and beyond what we give them to do. And so I salute them for their work. All right. Kim, were you intended for the video? I guess well, we can just roll through it. I mean, we can talk about it, but hopefully you've all seen it, which is really important. It shows the annual report. Um, how much time do I have? We can run through with the core values, which will, is real simple, our, our board members. Our current board chair is Delcy Lewis. She'll continue until 2021. The next page is the mission of um, NRC. And people really get confused. The Nonprofit Resource Center is a spine, I call it the umbrella. It's just a spine of neighbors building neighborhoods. So there's lots of different programs, but the Nonprofit Resource Center is the funding goes to that. Um, financial services, I've listed some of those. There's 22 organizations that we do right now. The next pay, are we going to close? Oh, thank you, sir. Um, the dollars that we've had given to 12 clients and a couple of things is the fire truck was written by us for the FEMA assistance to the firefighters grant. We're looking at an EDA CARES grant right now as I turn to look at my. Um, we've also had discussions with, with Roy about um, the Creek Nation and dollars that are coming in possibly through there. We kind of like to brag about we build other organizations up. We let the organizations do program. We do their back office work. Um, events, of course, you're going to see us everywhere. That's kind of that one. Um, Dueling in the Depot was our first fundraiser. We hope to be able to do that this year. I don't know if we will. It's one of those, we're all walking around not knowing what to do. Bonanza is a discussion point that Mr. Miller and I are going to have to have. We normally do just the nonprofit side. Main Street is not interested in doing the other part of that. So we'll need to have a conversation with that, even if it's going to happen. That's 3,000 people on Main Street. Um, our Okies Neighborhood Night Out has been <coughs> postponed. 
maybe cancel. Lindsay's going to help me give that the what ifs. That's at Robinson Park and Rotary Park. As I say Robinson Park, I look at Ivory. That's how I met him, is how we got funded first. When we first started, it was the funding, and we did fundraising for that. The next part is our little happy staff. You can see all of, of that group. One of our gems that we brag a lot about is the Martin Luther King Center. I mean, it has been closed since spring break. We knock on wood and hope that we'll open the 1st of August, give or take a few days. But what's more important is that we have 180 kids daily when we're open. We feed them a meal. They improve their grades. They have better attitudes and learning of that. Dream team, uh, the, the night hoops happened. It did not happen this summer. Another one of those sad ones. But last year, 91% felt that they provided a safe place to be on a weekend. And then 87% would recommend their program to their friends. Imagine 250 kids, well, it says 646 youth attend, 250 kids a night. Where are they at right now? They're not at night hoops, so they're out on the streets working. And then a really good testimonial from um, Ron Mays about night hoops and being involved. The next is the summer learning. That is the summer program from, I'm looking at Derek to get that, mm -hmm. from 8 to 2, 9 to 2. They yes. serve a breakfast, a lunch. Um, that's another 196 kids a day that are served during the summer. This summer we were closed, so we we're talking about last year's, but truly exciting things. And you'll see the percentages on there. They feel it's a safe place for the children. They thought their child would be better prepared in the fall. We have 66% of them learn new things, and 69 reported an increase in interested in learning. To me, that's very, very important. Um, we did a couple new things. We did a Dream Team All-Stars where we had volunteers that came in and, and did program during the Dream Team. That was last year. And the art and the exhibition programs, that was through the Muskogee Arts Council, Area Arts Council. Better than an alligator. If I hadn't hit you up last year, you were lucky. We built a, we built a playground that um, we talked about. We had the ugly old mall alligator that was out there with many accidents and because of some kind and charitable people led by Georgia Pacific, um, we built a playground and that was a pretty amazing project. There were $75,000 that were donated and we had 47 community volunteers. Again, great photos if you can see them. If not, please look at the website. Um, a VISTA program is one that gives community service to individuals. It is, there are four of them in town and eight during the summer. They serve five programs. I think the amazing part is estimate a uh, volunteer hour at $20 an hour. They gave 2,025 hours that were served. That truly impacts the community. USDA, we do summer food program during the summer. And we do summer now. We food, we feed during the fall and winter. So we're giving a program then. This is free food to people that need it most. Community Treasures is a summer program from 12.30 to 5.30. During the summer, it was, not, it was canceled this year. Again, 129 kids last year attended every day. We had a little STEAM summer program that helped uh, campers explore the STEM programs or the STEAM programs, as now you're putting arts back in there. Bridges Out of Poverty was with us until August. They've now branched on by their own. The Indigent Criminal Defense Program we had a really good grant through the Oklahoma Bar Foundation that allowed Jim McClure and Yesenia to do Ocho, now she's Gonzalez, to uh, work with Amnesty Day in partnership with, with Roy Tucker and other city staff to make sure they were there. And then our prevention programs, which have just blossomed um, under the guise of, of Lindsay Roberts. You can see that we have two different regions as well as Muskogee and um, Wagner County. We have a DFC grant, otherwise known as Drug Free Communities. And we have a Muskogee Community Anti-Drug Network. 10 years? 10 years of a program that's been going on. The things that I think are important with that program, 887 locks boxes, that's where you lock your medicine up, have been given out. Nine, this is just this year, 900, or last year, 2019. 950 pounds of prescription medication 
Dr. Hughes, you can attest to how many pills that comes out yeah. of somebody's hands. There are 49,297 community members that were reached. 150, Alex knows this one, RBSS training, that's responsible beverage sales and service training. We've seen his staff everywhere, so <laughs> that helps. We serve nine counties. It's not just Muskogee, but we emphasize totally in Muskogee. The regional prevention coordinators, we like to brag about those, so those are all there. And that's through the Oklahoma Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services. And then we do this large take back with um, the PFC by the partners, there's partnerships, say that fast. There's a spelling on that. Partner hitships um, for success. <laughs> The old proofreader never works for me. From Cherokee Nation, there were 488 lockboxes that were given through with Cherokee Nation, 25,000 community members that were reached. Think about the Think Smart, think about that. The Think Smart Channel 6 does all that media. We have paid for all of that media through Cherokee Nation and it keeps expanding. And then we wanna talk about, we are one of the few grant, I don't know how many in the state, DFCs? There's two DFCs and we're one of them. Um, that $625,000 grant, that's 125, 125. Lindsay's my puppeteer back there to help me with the, the prevention stuff. Um, and that was approved last year, 2019. So we'll have that continued. We give you our, our income and expenses. We are really, truly transparent. So if you have any questions on that, and then we list our donors. And I'm sure that we've missed them, and we've missed some, but you know, we do our best, and we thank every one of them personally. So that's our quick and dirty on our annual report. If you, again, if you have any questions, please, I'll be glad to answer them. Kim, is the CARES grant you all are gonna work on, is that for another fire truck? See, I, I don't I do this well? No, <laughs> isn't it with the EDA with a, <coughs> the, the CARES grant um, has to be tied directly to the COVID-19 uh, okay. emergency, so we're looking at uh, currently a street improvement package near and around the hospital in the medical district. That's perfect for that. Thank you. Rebecca Walkup and Julie Moss are the two proposal writers that work on that. All right. <clears throat> Any qu questions for Kim? Do we have be recognized? Yes. I'd like to thank you, Ms. Lynch, for a wonderful job that you always do for our community, mm -hmm. especially with our children. I think you're a great lady. I respect you well. Thank you. And I just thank you for everything you do and your staff. Because I know it takes Say people. Say them first before yes. me. <laughs> yeah. And Ms. Lynch. I thank all of y'all. Thank you, Irene. Y'all do a great job. I appreciate I, it, Councilor Van. I turn the floor back over to you, Ms. Chairman. Thank you. Do we have a motion, Tammy? No. I'm seeking a motion. Move for approval. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve this contract for grant services. Any further questions? Roll call, please. Tracy Hoos. Yes. Tracy McGee. Yes. Stephanie Morgan. Yes. Alex Reynolds. Yes. Evelyn Hibbs. Yes. Jamie Stout. Yes. Ivory Van. Yes. Deputy Mayor Derek Reed. Abstain. Mayor Marlon Coleman. Yes. Item number four passes. Item number five, please. Consider approval of a cooperative agreement between the City of Muskogee and Muskogee County Public Transit Authority to provide public transportation services within the City of Muskogee or take other necessary action. Mr. Garber. This is the annual agreement between the City of Muskogee and the Muskogee County Public Transit Authority. It's to provide transportation services within the City of Muskogee. Uh, the City will pay the Authority $76,422 biannually. Total contract price is $152,884. It is also a one-year contract running from July 1st, 2020 through July or through June 30th, 2021. No changes from last year's agreement. A copy of the agreement, the annual report, and the Muskogee routes was included in your packet. Uh, Dina Wilson, who is the executive director of the authority, is present to give you a quick uh, update or report and answer any questions you may have.
Thank you, everyone. Um, our annual audit was completed this year early, actually, in January, and uh, Mr. Miller and Mr. Tucker got copies of it when it was completed by the auditors in January. I did not include it in this packet. Um, actually, quite frankly, it's been out so long <laughs> I forgot about it. Um, We've been providing transportation in the county of Muskogee since 1986. Um, I hope you all have had the time to look over this report and what I'd really like to hit on and, and highlight is some of the things that we've been working on in the little bit of downtime that we've had through this COVID-19 and the, uh, the fact that things have been slow at our office because we had a 62% decline in ridership because of COVID-19. We are beginning to come back up, but we utilize that time to uh, analyze our fixed routes that we were running. And um, when we uh, began providing services again in uh, the month of May on the fixed routes, we uh, completely revamped them and our current riders seem to be much happier with the stops. We've gotten a lot of good um, feedback from our ridership on the changes that we've made. And instead of just having one spot at the mall every hour where people could change buses, now we have three. Um, we have vehicles that meet at Walmart during the hour. We have all of the vehicles at the mall during the hours, and we have, all, we have vehicles at Lakeland Shopping Center during the hour. So the people in town have more options without having to ride two hours to get from one side of town to the other. I think that that's been a big help um, to get our citizens to where they wanted to go faster. Um, we also uh, have used some uh, CARES funding that we received from ODOT uh, to purchase two new vehicles, which um, we are utilizing their minivans, and we are utilizing them to increase our curb-to-curb -curb demand service. And when we um, began back up after COVID, we are trying to provide same-day service with those vehicles. So instead of having two demand curb to curb in the morning and one in the afternoon, we now have three in the morning and two, sometimes three in the afternoon um, to uh, be able to better accommodate people's needs, get more people to work and home from work. Um, and uh, we have uh, a plan in the future uh, to purchase three more vehicles um, before December of this year to continue to increase those services as things increase in the city and our ridership increases. Um, our, if any of you remember our graph from last year, our ridership statistics for this year greatly changed. Um, last year, our, our statistics of other riders was in um, the 70th percentile and this year it's down to 50% as our ridership for elderly and disabled has increased immensely. Um, and uh, we are striving as best as we possibly can to continue to provide the best service we can to those folks in our city. Uh, I'd like to open it up to any questions that anyone might have. Mr. Chairman, uh, to the executive director, is it possible for us to get a copy of the three-year plan along with the audit and the dates and times of those routes that have been provided? The dates and times of the routes are in this uh, paperwork. There's actually, um, at the back of your packet, there is this sheet that's got all three of the fixed routes on the two pages right here. That, that's in the packet that I sent. Um, and um, You said it had dates and times on it? You know, I don't think that it does. It, it shows the whole hour, the hours round. It goes that round every hour. But certainly I can absolutely send those things to you via email. Is that sufficient? I think the council should get a copy of the audit and the, um, the three-year plan. Um, and if it's the chair's pleasure, I'd just like for this to advance without recommendation. All Until right. we have that information. All right. Do we have a uh, second on that? Second. Okay. Uh, 
Once, uh, Roy, can you explain what we'll be voting on, please? Mr. Chairman, since you all are in committee, um, you have the option to, uh, if you approve it, it'll go on consent agenda. And so if the motion is to move it forward without recommendation, then it will appear on the regular agenda at the regular city council meeting next week and can be fully discussed again at that time. And for us, it's just a matter of having up that other information so that we can have read that before we vote. Sure. I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect, Mr. Chair, another full presentation. Sure. But just that we have opportunity to review those items. All right. Mitchell? Yes. Mr. Chairman, I'll be recognized. Yes. I would just like to say, say that uh, one day again, me and Mr. Miller, we're going to get on that, those transits and come ride. We've we done that before. Mm -hmm. And y'all still have those same bus drivers or y'all have switched up? One of the many downfalls to COVID is we lost about half of our drivers because the majority of our drivers were over 65. And um, most of them chose to retire during that time to stay home and be safe. Um, we have been diligently working to bring our staff back up. We went from 32 down to 18 and we have managed to get back to 25 and still diligently working to hire to replace the rest. That's actually the biggest hurdle that we have right now is finding employees, getting people to apply that can pass a background check and a drug test. I can say when we did ride the bus, me and Mr. Miller, we went on all those routes. I mean, those are some nice drivers. I mean, those, the people that rode the bus, I mean, those drivers would go out their way for them. Yeah. And I really, I thought a lot, I thought a lot about them that day. And We yeah. would love to have any of you and all of you ride at any opportunity um it it uh it the the drivers love to have any of y'all ride with them and 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 tell you about their jobs and what they do and th that that's that's what they're there for is to help the people and they love it well, i'll say one thing kindness comes when you ride that bus to those senior citizens by those drivers and thank you also for all you do for the Muscogee Transit. I'll turn the floor back over to you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Everyone clear on the motion that's before us? Roll call, please. Tracy Hoos. Yes. Tracy McGee. Yes. Stephanie Morgan. Yes. Alex Reynolds. Yes. Evelyn Hibbs. Yes. Jamie Stout. Yes. Ivory Van. Yes. Deputy Mayor Derek Reed. Yes. Mayor Marlon Coleman. Yes. Item number five will move with recommendations on next week once again without uh, presentation but we will be receiving additional information and see this item next week item number six please consider approval of change order number two to construction contract with mcguire brothers for the 30 inch waterline improvements project for a relocation of an eight inch conflicting waterline or take other necessary action. Mr. Stewart. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I need this move forward to Monday City Council without recommendation. We have some last minute changes to the change order and we're not ready to present it, but we will be Monday night. Thank you. All right, that was our final item on the Finance Committee meeting. I'll call to order the Public Works Committee meeting, Ju July 20th, 2020, item number one. Consider approval of Public Works Committee minutes of July 6, 2020. Move for approval. Second. Discussion? Roll call. Tracy Hoos. Yes. Tracy McGee. Yes. Stephanie Morgan. Yes. Alex Reynolds. Yes. Evelyn Hibbs. Yes. Jamie Stout. Yes. Ivory Van. Yes. Deputy Mayor Derek Reed. Yes. Mayor Marlon Coleman. Yes. And the item passes. Item number two. Hold a public hearing and take action on the approval of resolution number 2820, amending the land use map regarding property located in the 600 block of South Main, more particularly described in the resolution from local commercial to multifamily residential, and if approved, authorize staff to revise the land use map of the city to reflect said change. I'll open the public hearing, Chish. Thank you, um, Madam Chair and uh, committee members, this is a request from the city of Muskogee and also the applicant that would require the land use map to be amended. It is to amend it from the current local commercial district to a multifamily residential district. It is to allow for the rezoning application to be heard, which is next after this, if approved. This map does show the site and the current zonings that are around the site. 
And this is from our future uh, land use map and comprehensive plan. It does explain the commercial uh, corridor and why it was um, identified. It was to um, complement the downtown businesses, not to deter from them. Here's the site again. And this is a closer view of the area. You'll see that um, the site's highlighted to the uh, north is the Seventh-day Adventist building. That's the former Salvation Army building. To the south directly is Car Wash. Then on the corner is the Double K Burgers. Um, shameless plug for them, I understand they're very good. Um, and then there's single family homes that are um, to the west of the property. This is looking at the front of the property from South Main. This is on the opposite end, which is on South Street, which would then be looking east. There's to the southwest, the car wash, the Seventh-day Adventist building. Take a little farther. Directly across the street, which is directly east. Northeast. This is on Main as you're going to the southeast. And the Double K Burgers. This is uh, from the north to the south. It is a narrow uh, parcel, but it does reach from Main Street to Second Street. And this is across Second Street that is single family residential. So this land use amendment does ask a request to change it from the local commercial to the multifamily. It is to allow for the rezoning request and staff planning and planning commission have recommended approval. I'll be happy to answer any questions. No citizen signed up to speak, so I'll close the public hearing. Council discussion. Ms. Ms. Chair, um, and uh, Tish, how many duplexes are they planning to put in? Well, it would depend on um, the size of her duplexes. She was um, discussing to do small uh, housing, um, something like the Arts District homes that were there, smaller. And it's going to depend on the um, drive approaches and how they're laid out. She hasn't um, designed them yet, but that was what she was hoping to do, was to put in at least a couple. And that's why we went with multifamily rather than just one duplex, two family. Will the design go back to Planning Commission? Uh, the site plan does not need to go. It would have to be approved through the um, planning and the permitting process where staff and the um, inspections looks at it okay. for setbacks and make sure it makes those requirements. I was just curious as to the, how they would look, uh, how many would go yeah. in. <laughs> Tish, now, will the frontage of these homes be on 2nd Street or Main Street? Um, and that depends on how she lays it out. Um, what's interesting about it and part of what, and I explained to Planning Commission this morning, was looking at changing it uh, f to the residential was there is that center median, if you'll notice, along Main Street. And in the zoning um, item, I do show the kind of like the like terrible traffic engineering drawing is there's no access. And they would have to get an access off of Main Street. So I believe um, if, th if they don't get the Department of Transportation to allow an access, they're gonna have to access the property from Second Street, which would be through a residential district. So if it were to ever be commercial, more than likely it would have to be commercial through the uh, residential area. So that's why if, um, if it does w work out that it's a duplex or it's a, you know, a multifamily, uh, fourplex, what, however they decide to build, um, I think it, it would have a better use than trying to get commercial sweeping around Second Street, if that makes sense. <laughs> Chairman, sure I recognize. Yes. Tish, I'm just so glad to see something. I, I ain't putting words in council and read them out, and I'll just say it ivory. <laughs> <laughs> that I'm so glad to see something coming down on South mm -hmm. Main. Mm -hmm. You know, because South Main compared to North Main, it's like night and day. So I'm just, I'm glad, you know, this is a good investment. I'll turn the floor back over to you, Ms. Chair. Thank you. Move for approval. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any more discussion? Call for the vote. Tracy Hoos. Yes. Tracy McGee. Yes. Stephanie Morgan. Yes. Alex Reynolds. Yes. Evelyn Hibbs. Yes. Jamie Stout. Yes. Ivory Van. Yes. Deputy Mayor Derek Reed. Yes. Mayor Marlon Coleman. Yes. And the motion carries. Item number three. 
hold a public hearing and take action on the approval of ordinance number 4097A to rezone the north 79 feet of lot 16, block 62, Muskogee Original Town Site, City of Muskogee, from R5 Mobile Home Residential to R4 Multifamily Residential, and if approved, authorize staff to revise the official zoning map of the city to reflect said change or take other necessary action. I'll open the public hearing. Ms. Callahan. Yes, thank you. This is the request that now that the land use uh, has been amended allows for the rezoning to a residential zoning classification. And this is from an R5 mobile home site. That is what it is currently zoned. And this is a request to go to the R4, which is multifamily. It does allow for the development of duplexes. And here again is the map that shows the area and the surrounding properties. And this is what I was talking about, my um, terrible traffic engineering map, but if you'll notice the arrows and which uh, they don't have access for that particular property, it would need to be accessed off of 2nd Street. Um, I honestly don't think, I know that the property owners, uh, the car wash and the 7th Avenue were petitioning to have the center median removed um, so that you could access it northbound but if you do so, you would end up having a lot of um, vehicles stacked, possibly, depending on how busy, into the West Side Boulevard and Independence intersection. So I highly doubt that the center median would get removed, and it may be um, very difficult to, for her to get an access off of Main Street with as many access as there are. So that is kind of where we're going is to um, encouraging, while commercial would be good, it would be allow at least some sort of um, development in the area on that parcel. That does show the site. It does now comply with the future land use map. Staff and Planning Commission recommend approval. No citizen signed up to speak, so I'll close the public hearing. Council discussion? Ms. Callahan, do you know if they've reached out to ODOT as of yet? I do not know that. I haven't. They may want to be encouraged if they think that's a Before. viable option mm -hmm. to know that it does take some time for ODOT to fulfill that type of request yes. with the different studies that have to be done. Okay. The, the proposal may want to know that in advance. Right, because it could change their layout design also. So I will do that. Thank you. Move for approval. Second. Roll call. Tracy Hoos? Yes. Tracy McGee? Yes. Stephanie Morgan? Yes. Alex Reynolds? Yes. Evelyn Hibbs? Yes. Jamie Stout? Yes. Ivory Van? Yes. Deputy Mayor Derek Reed? Yes. Mayor Marlon Coleman? Yes. And it passes. Item number four? Hold a public hearing and take action on the approval of Ordinance Number 4101A to rezone 600 North Main, more particularly described in the ordinance from I-1 Light Industrial to C-2 General Commercial, and if approved, authorize staff to revise the official zoning map of the city to reflect said change or take other necessary action. We will now open the public hearing. Ms. Callahan. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is a request from the Muskogee 600 LLC. It is to rezone the property from the uh, current I-1 light industrial to the C-2 general commercial. And it is for a new Dollar Tree. They're currently doing the demolition on the property to, to prepare for the construction. It does come under compliance with the uh, zoning regulations for the use. The C2 would be better uh, zoning classification. It wouldn't be allowed in the I-1 light industrial, so we're trying to get everything into compliance. There is the site. And there's a lot of traffic out in, during the day. <laughs> kind of a, a view of it from the different angles. The zoning around it is C2 to the um, east is still industrial and that is for the, we'll see for the railway. <coughs> and it does comply with the future land use map. It would not have an, a negative impact on the neighborhood, uh, the staff believes, and uh, Staff Ab Planning Commission recommend approval. Be happy to answer any questions. Tish, would this dollar uh, store replace the one in the mall? Is that the. the That's my understanding. Land? Yes. No it's citizen a, a signed up. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No citizen signed up to speak. Does the council have any more questions? Move for approval. Second. Roll call. Tracy Hoos? Yes. Tracy McGee? No. 
Stephanie Morgan. <laughs> yes. Alex Reynolds. Yes. Evelyn Hibbs. Yes. Jamie Stout. Yes. Ivory Van. Yes. Deputy Mayor Derek Reed. Yes. Mayor Marlon Coleman. Yes. And the item passes. Item number five. Consider approval of the preliminary and final plat of Scott Towers edition consisting of one lot on 2.98 acres located at 3217 North 32nd Street or take other necessary action. We will open the public hearing. Ms. Callahan. Thank you. Um, this is a request from uh, Wes Scott with Scott Towers and it is the preliminary and final plat for Scott Towers edition. It is a one lot subdivision on 2.98 acres. It has been addressed as 3217 North 32nd Street and uh, subdivision review and staff have recommended approval. Uh, kind of give you an idea of where this is. This does relocate his tower um, company uh, headquarters and he had been located in Jenks so it brings it back to Muskogee he had been on South 24th and coming back so this will bring his employees back to Muskogee also so which is a good thing to come back to Muskogee this is the site along 32nd um, to the northwest is the former BRB and then you have trucks for you that is to the south of it it did meet subdivision regulations and all comments uh, that were made, and he does have the ODOT approval for access. He has acquired that just this uh, recently, so um, staff does recommend approval, as did Planning Commission. No citizen signed up to speak. Council? Move for approval. Second. Okay. Second. Discussion? Roll call. Tracy Hoos? Yes. Tracy McGee? Yes. Stephanie Morgan? Yes. Alex Reynolds? Yes. Evelyn Hibbs? Yes. Jamie Stout? Yes. Ivory Van? Yes. Deputy Mayor Derek Reed? Yes. Mayor Marlon Coleman? Yes. And the motion passes. Item number six. Consider approval to grant a subterranean anchor easement to the United States of America Department of Veterans Affairs or take other necessary action. Uh, we will open the public hearing. No, oh, we don't need one for that. Oh, we don't need one for no. that. <laughs> it never hurts, right? <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, this is a request from the Veterans Administration um, to ask for an additional easement. We've had, as you know, the temporary construction and then the permanent uh, easement for their access, the road that will go up from the west side of the property on 40th, 48th to the back side of the building. And with that, they're building a retaining wall. And then during the um, surveying and discovery, they had found that there is a portion of the wall anchor that will go into the ground, outside and into the ground, that is uh, then um, goes onto city property. And this is just a safeguard to keep that property um, safe as an easement. So if there's any construction that ever happens to go around it, it is protected that they don't dig down and get the anchor um, dug up. There is a representative from the uh, VA here to speak on it, the project chief, uh, Mr. Greg Riley. If you have any questions, he has more technical information than I do on it. Move for approval. Second. Second. Discussion? Roll call. Tracy Hoos. Yes. Tracy McGee. Yes. Stephanie Morgan. Yes. Alex Reynolds. Yes. Evelyn Hibbs. Yes. Jamie Stout. Yes. Ivory Van. Yes. Deputy Mayor Derek Reed. Yes. Mayor Marlon Coleman. Yes. And the motion passes. Item number seven. Consider approval of the appointment of John Schilt to the Muskogee City County Port Authority to serve a four-year term beginning September 1, 2020 and ending August 31, 2024 or take other necessary action. This is uh, an appointment and I've brought John Schultz's name forward. I've known him for years and years. I know he's been a valuable uh, member of the, the Port Authority, so I would move to, to have him reappointed. Second. A motion and a second discussion. Yes, may I be recognized, Mr. Chair? Yes, yes, Mr. Van. For the new councilman up here, I uh, wanted to bring this to y'all's attention. When I first started up here as a councilman in 2014, I remember the port, and I'm so glad that someone brought this to my attention today. I had, at that time, I had all my documents in place, but Mr. Sh how you pronounce his name, Schultz? Schultz. Schultz. I got one that says September 1996. 
he, he, he was on that port board. And he's continued to be on the port board along with others like Mr. Jones, which is gonna be uh, nominated here in just a little bit. I have no problem with none of these gentlemen that's gonna be nominated. But the problem I have is that we live in Muskogee, Oklahoma, and it should be some change sometime. This gentleman, like I see, this paper right here, 1996, it says Three Forks Landing. Welcome to Three Forks Landing. But he's been on the port board quite a while off and on. So I got the members of the board right here, and I'm gonna look in a lot of men, and I see one woman, Nancy Gayton. The rest of them are men. And what I'm looking at here is, it's no diversity. You don't have people of color except one. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you the story how we got there. In 1996, Miss Stella Derrick, she was on the port board. Mm -hmm. She was the only black woman on the port board. So before I even had an appointment, I went to the county commissioners because I looked at the list they had, we had then, still wasn't no minorities on the board. So I asked them, pleaded with them, twice, put some minorities on the board. Okay, they still didn't do it. So back in uh, 2016, September of 2016, I had the opportunity to put a black person finally after Ms. Derrick took, t remember I said 1996 when Ms. Derrick served. That was her last time being on the board. 2016 is 20 years later, 20 years later, to finally, when it came to me, God put me in that position. And I appointed Toby Ledbetter, which I'm pretty sure everybody in the room knows Toby Ledbetter. She helped with the council. She's a very good appointee, you know, that I appointed. But to this day, Toby, I don't blame her, she had to quit. And she left April 4th, 2019, because she wanted to go to Tulsa and she had got a better job in Tulsa, and I can't blame her. So after that, uh, it was another person appointed. Wasn't black, but they were appointed. So here we go again. So I told the council, I said, please, next time we have some appointments, please get with me and let me know so, so I can maybe get you someone. I know these are business people, but you also have business people in the community that are black, Hispanic. Look at the hotels. Look at all those business people, Asians. I believe that, I believe what Mr. Patel and them are. But none of them represents the, this board, I don't see. Unless I'm wrong, that's Mr. Robinson telling me I'm, I'm saying something wrong up here and I'll be happy to, if he is, you know, to, uh, to uh, correct me. So, <laughs> Leading up to now, uh, in August the 12th, 2019, it was time for Mr. Gilder to come off. <laughs> so we had a councilman up here, just so having God worked it out again. It was Councilman Reed. He's a black councilman. So he appointed Mayor Coleman. He's the first black mayor proud of him here in Muskogee, city of Muskogee. So between me and Councilman Reed, that's how we finally, over all these years, got somebody black on the Port Authority board. But like I said, I knew the councilman up here tonight. They didn't, they didn't know this story because they wasn't around then. But I thank, that, I thank God that you, Councilman Coleman, Mayor Coleman, you're on the board. But I was hoping and praying that someone else would appoint another count, uh, person of color. I don't care if they're black, I don't care if they're his, uh, Hispanic, which is no Hispanics on this board. None of these people that I got a list right here. No, I, don't, I know most of all of them, none of them is Hispanic. So I'm, I'm trying to get the council to look at things. The county commissioners didn't do it, but you had, you had to take the black councilman up here to put somebody on that board. Now, one thing I'm going to say this, and I'm going to be quiet. I never will forget, I went out there one time. You probably remember this, Mr. Robinson. Remember when we took a ride on that boat? You remember that, sir? It was me. It was Miss uh, Ledbetter, her daughter, and Pam. We <coughs> rode that boat around and took the port. 
I said to myself when I was riding that night, if I hadn't appointed Miss Ledbetter on this Port Authority board, mm -hmm. these black folks wouldn't be on this boat riding around because nobody else would do it. So in the future, one of these days, I hope, I may not be up here, I just hope that you're taking the port board, the, the councilmen, the county commissioners, taking consideration there are other people here in Muskogee that can, that's business people, that can serve just as well as all these people here that we're getting ready to point tonight has been on this board a long time. Back and forth, back and forth. That's how you do it, back and forth. So I just wanted to bring y'all attention, something y'all didn't know, which I know y'all didn't know. But the other thing about being up here and starting down at that mic in 2005, I've learned a lot. And I've seen a lot. And there's nothing I'm lying about. But I just wish, taking the next time, just like I told you before, please, council, take in consideration, when you appoint people on these boards, look at the diversity of the boards and see how many people we have on these boards and go from there. That's how I do mine. I look at the diversity of the board. If they don't have it, I'm going to find somebody. I went to the Indian community one night. Got some people on the boards. Get out and search, just because it's your friend or the good old boy or like that. Because I'm, you know what? I want my kids to grow up here in Muskogee. They grew up here in Muskogee. But one thing I'm always telling them, and I'm a councilman, and I'm not ashamed to say it. I say, son, daughters, go to school, get an education, but get out of here. Because they've been different places with me, you know, New York, different places. But it don't look good, and I hope y'all get to picture this, how this happened. It don't look good for just black councilmen to be appointing a black person to, uh, you got to have one, one, at least one. It should be more than that. So please take in consideration, appoint minorities and diversity on these boards, especially the Port Authority Board. I'll turn the floor back over to you, Ms. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Bain. Do I have a motion? Have a second. motion second. Yes. Okay, roll call. Tracy Hoos? Yes. Tracy McGee? Yes. Stephanie Morgan? Yes. Alex Reynolds? Yes. Evelyn Hibbs? Yes. Jamie Stout? Yes. Ivory Van? Yes. Deputy Mayor Derek Reed? Yes. Mayor Marlon Coleman? Yes. And the motion passes. Item number eight. Consider approval of the appointment of David P. Jones to the Muskogee City County <coughs> Port Authority to serve a four-year term beginning September 1, 2020 and, in and ending August 31, 2024, or take other necessary action. Councilman Reynolds, this is your appointment. Uh, yes, I move uh, that we uh, nominate David Jones to the Port Authority Board. Second. Discussion? Roll call. Tracy Hoos? Yes. Tracy McGee? Yes. Stephanie Morgan? Yes. Alex Reynolds? Yes. Evelyn Hibbs? Yes. Jamie Stout? Yes. Ivory Van? Yes. Deputy Mayor Derek Reed? Yes. Mayor Marlon Coleman? Yes. And the motion passes. Item number nine. Consider approval of the appointment of Tim Wheeler to the Muskogee City County Port Authority to serve a four-year term beginning September 1, 2020 and ending on August 31, 2024, or take other necessary action. Councilman Stout. Yes, I move for approval. Second. Discussion? Roll call. Tracy Hoos. Yes. Tracy McGee. Yes. Stephanie Morgan. Yes. Alex Reynolds. Yes. Evelyn Hibbs. Yes. Jamie Stout. Yes. Ivory Van. Yes. Deputy Mayor Derek Reed. Yes. Mayor Marlon Coleman. Yes. And the motion passes. We have two citizens that have signed up to speak. I believe one by telephone mm -hmm. and one in person. Do we want to do the in person to Misha? Is she in person? I don't see her in the room. Okay. And on the phone is Annette Williams. Yes. Would you give us your name and, and your address, please? Uh, Annette Williams, 1421 Tudor Road, Muskogee, Oklahoma, 74403. You have three minutes. Okay. Um, I have had a really horrible year with your water department. Um, they're not easy to deal with. And you guys are the ones that decide whether something passes or doesn't pass and you write what they can approve or not approve is what I've been told. So right now you have to come in, you have to fill out paperwork, you have to bring paperwork with you, make sure that you own the house, you have to bring ID, all of that. 
Um, I just got water service on in Tulsa. I called them up. I gave them all my information. I was done and over with the phone call 30 minutes. And I, it took me, when I did it with their process right now, it took me all of 30 minutes, maybe less, except for the direct deposit. The direct deposit, they decide they need to mail it to you and you need to send a voided check back, which makes no sense if you're gonna take all this other information by by email, why can't you take that information by email? Anyway, it caused me to have a huge um, late payment and then fees on top of that because it turned off service because I wasn't notified properly. I just wish you guys would keep in place what you have going now and amend it to include direct deposit information. And I know your phones are recorded, but if you could even turn them off during recording or ask the person for permission, my routing number and account number are on all my checks I write to everybody. So to me, it's no different than if I wrote somebody a check than if I send you a picture of my voided check. Because I have a weakened immune system and I try my best to stay indoors as much as possible or not cause my husband some undue hardship because he is already doing so much. And whenever I was going through chemo, radiation, they did it all by um, all by the phone or email and it worked great for me and then my lady that I always worked with and I put lots of money into Muskogee I plan on staying in Muskogee Muskogee is my home I would like more people to feel wanted by Muskogee I literally felt like why am I investing money in Muskogee if I can't even turn on a water service I mean that seems pretty simple to me to be able to just turn on water service and it's an act of Congress to get water on. And they're not friendly. So when you call, they don't like their job and they're taking it out on me. It's just, I, it's, I've i not had a great experience at all. It, I've had to do a lot with the city um, because we've, we've bought and sold property and tried to build up Muskogee at all possible. And it doesn't seem like something so easy as we can get it by email, like everybody else. I'm sorry, and Mrs. Simpson, your time is up. Williams. Okay. Williams. I'm, I'm on the wrong one. That's fine. Thank you very much. And with that, the uh, public works is adjourned. We'll now call to order the special call meeting for the Muskogee City Council for July 20, 2020. Roll call. Mayor Marlon Coleman. Here. Deputy Mayor Derek Reed. Here. Ivory Van. Here. Jamie Stout. Here. Evelyn Hibbs. Here. Alex Reynolds. Here. Stephanie Morgan. Here. Tracy McGee. Here. Tracy Hoos. Here. We're all accounted for. Item number one. Consider approval of resolution number 2823 authorizing the Muskogee Municipal Authority, the authority to issue its sales tax revenue note series 2020 in the aggregate principal amount of six million eight hundred twenty six thousand dollars waiving competitive bidding and authorizing the note to be sold on a negotiated basis approving and authorizing the execution of a sales agreement by and between the city of muskogee oklahoma i'm sorry i'm reading the wrong item That's that is I, I so my mistake i have them out of order I thought it was like <laughs> let's start that over all right Consider approval of resolution number 2822 of the City of Muskogee, Oklahoma, approving the incurrence of indebtedness by the Muskogee Municipal Authority, issuing its sales tax revenue note, Series 2020, providing that the organizational document creating the authority is subject to the provisions of the note indenture, authorizing the issuance of said note, waiving competitive bidding with respect to the sale of the said note, and approving the proceedings of the authority pertaining to the sale of said note, approving and authorizing a sales tax agreement by and between the city and authority pertaining to the year-to-year -year pledge of certain sales and use tax revenues, establishing the city's reasonable expectation with respect to the issuance of tax-exempt obligations by or on behalf of said city in calendar year 2020, and designating the note as a qualified tax-exempt obligation and containing other provisions relating thereto or take other necessary action. Mr. Miller. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Mayor. Um, what we have before you is 
really the uh, the culmination of the the CIP sales tax, and this is all the the projects that the citizens voted to approve in 2019. Uh, it, part of those projects, we said we're going to borrow money so we don't have to wait for all the tax money to come in. We're going to do the projects as soon as we can. Uh, a few months ago, you guys authorized us to go out and start soliciting bids to uh, take on that indebtedness. So what we have tonight are three different agenda items to kind of allow that. Um, this one, uh, the uh, indebtedness is going to take place within the municipal authority. And this, uh, for the trust to take on the indebtedness, the, the city has to approve that and allow that to happen. Um, so that really is what this agenda item is about. It allows us to move forward. Um, we did receive those, uh, those bids back, and we can address that and when we get to the MMA meeting uh, and, and look at the actual note um, of the $6.8 million. The bids were very competitive uh, and favorable to, uh, to what we're trying to do. Um, so this basically allows us to go ahead um, and uh, this approval allows the MMA to take on that debt um, when we get to that agenda item. So staff um, recommends approval. Um, we do have our bond counsel here, uh, Nate Ellis, and we do have Ben Oglesby, our, our financial advisor here. They can answer questions on this agenda item or, or the MMA one as, uh, as needed. But we do recommend approval here uh, to allow the indebtedness to occur. Mr. Miller's... Um either this agenda or the next one, is this where you want to talk about the interest, how low it was? Uh, the, I, I think it'd probably be more appropriate to talk about that when we're talking about the note itself. That's fine. Um. Do we have any discussion from the council? Or a motion? Move for approval. Second. It's been properly moved in a second. Roll call. Tracy Hoos. Yes. Tracy McGee. Yes. Stephanie Morgan. Yes. Alex Reynolds. Yes. Evelyn Hibbs. Yes. Jamie Stout. Yes. Ivory Van. Yes. Deputy Mayor Derek Reed. Yes. Mayor Marlon Coleman. Yes. The item passes. Item number two. Consider and take action with respect to ordinance number 4103A, amending the City of Muskogee Code of Ordinances by amending Chapter 74, Taxation, Article 8, Use Tax, by amending Section 74-236, Dedication and Apportionment, modifying apportionment of the portion of the tax for debt service on certain obligations issued on behalf of the city by the Muskogee Municipal Authority, providing for repealer, severability, and declaring an emergency. Mr. Tucker. Uh, Mayor, members of the council, uh, this is a modification to our existing uh, apportionment of our use tax that we uh, do collect. Uh, as many of you will remember, the use tax is what is used to fund economic development. Uh, as part of the uh, note agreement and the bids that were received, uh, it was necessary to uh, give some assurances to the banks that not only would appropriate sales tax levels uh, be at an amount to repay this uh, should the tax collections not be able to uh, meet the requirements, but also to uh, allow use tax to potentially be used to um, secure that indebtedness. And so the provision uh, contained within the uh, Ordinance 74-236 that is presented effectively still allows the use tax to be deposited into the Economic Development Fund. However, it subjects that to assurances that all funds uh, will be available to pay back any of the debt uh, prior to um, it going into that ec Economic Development Fund. And this is simply done to uh, provide additional assurances to the bank in this economic climate. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. I do recommend approval. And as a separate matter, this will need to be voted on uh, as an emergency as well. Mr. Tucker, that doesn't prevent us from using the use tax money if we need to. Correct. It's just uh, leverage in the event that something goes wrong. We do have something to show that we can provide Absolutely. coverage. Thank you. Council? Move for approval. Second. Is there properly moved and second? Any further discussion? So let me be clear here. On the sales tax, you're saying if it's, if it's not where we want it to be, uh, then we'll tap into the use tax to be able to carry on. To manage that debt. Manage That's that correct. Debt. Okay. Thank you. Any other discussion? Roll call. Tracy Hoos. Yes. Tracy McGee. Yes. Stephanie Morgan. Yes. Alex Reynolds. Yes. Evelyn Hibbs. Yes. Jamie Stout. Yes. Ivory Van. Yes. Deputy Mayor Derek Reed. Yes. Mayor Marlon Coleman. Yes. Item passes. Item and number. We I'm need, sorry. Do I make a motion we move to declare it an emergency? Thank you. 
Second. It's been properly moved and seconded to declare an emergency. Roll call. Tracy Hoos. Yes. Tracy McGee. Yes. Stephanie Morgan. Yes. Alex Reynolds. Yes. Evelyn Hibbs. Yes. Jamie Stout. Yes. Ivory Van. Yes. Deputy Mayor Derek Reed. Yes. Mayor Marlon Coleman. Yes. And the item passes. Item number three. Receive report on the COVID-19 pandemic in Muskogee, and if necessary, take appropriate action to authorize and approve a subsequent amendment to resolution number 2801, declaring a local emergency or city county joint resolution number 2803. Before I turn this section of the agenda over to Mr. Miller, I'd like to read an opening statement. Any approach we take as a municipality to combating COVID-19 must be a measured approach. By that, I mean taking into consideration trends and infection rates as they relate to Muskogee. We cannot make decisions for our city based on what other cities have done. Other cities should be basing their decisions on their medical and scientific trends compiled from information vetted by the state health department along with their local medical experts. Tulsa had an event, unfortunately, that did not require social distancing or mandate the wearing of masks which many of their experts as well as others around the state believe contributed to their community spread in their city. Because of their dilemma, they took the necessary steps to mandate the wearing of masks by all individuals when they were in public. Muskogee has not experienced such a spread as of this time. The primary categories for measuring COVID-19 in local communities in the state of Oklahoma from lowest to highest are green, yellow, orange, and red. Currently, Muskogee is in yellow. I believe using a measured approach can keep our COVID-19 cases from advancing as well as in the community. This approach may sound simple, but if practiced, our residents will prevent spread in our community. And much of what I'm getting ready to say, you'll hear again from our task force on tonight. Number one, whether you believe in wearing masks or not, practice common courtesy in public. Tonight, the task force will strongly recommend the wearing of masks and practicing a social distancing when in public. Muskogee is only better together when we respectfully appreciate the decision of others to wear a mask or not to wear a mask. Arguing among ourselves because someone chooses to wear or not wear a mask only divides us and allows COVID-19 to be victorious. Number two, businesses are encouraged to do whatever they need to maintain the safety of their employees as well as those of their patrons. If that means requiring your employees to wear masks or requiring your customers to do the same, then do that. Many of our small businesses are struggling, sometimes because of an inability to maintain a workforce who may justifiably be afraid of going to work for their own safety if masks are not required. Number three, if you know you have a medical condition or are at risk, avoid public places as much as possible, and if you must be out, please Wear a mask and practice social distancing. I'm asking others to remember that when you do wear a mask, you're only trying to protect others who the disease will overcome if we don't come together as a community to keep fellow Muskogeans safe. Finally, number four, no one wants to mandate to follow the previous courses of action, which included the temporary closing of small businesses. I believe a forced mandate at this time will be the first step towards regulating small businesses in a way that can result in them permanently closing their doors. What you will hear tonight, in addition to what I've already presented, are recommendations. Recommendations to be considered by this body for approval or disapproval. Government's role should never supersede Americans' willingness to voluntarily do what is right for the benefit of your other fellow Americans. But be aware. If we don't take responsibility to self-govern ourselves against the threat of COVID-19, and if our current condition worsens from yellow to orange, harsher, more restrictive measures may be recommended and subsequently adopted. For that reason alone, I'm encouraging all of our residents to wear masks wherever possible. I'll now turn this portion of the floor over to Mr. Miller, who will navigate the rest of our presentations, and then hear recommendations from the task force and other actions that may be recommended from the city council. Thank you, Mayor and members of council. Um, this is a very important issue, and as we've seen across the state and across the nation, um, the, this is a pandemic that is not showing any signs of abating. Um, there are a few things I want to discuss, uh, uh, further recommendations. Um, number one, what we're doing as an employer, uh, we are re revisiting our workplace protocols uh, regarding distancing, masks, 
uh, in how our employees interact with each other uh, to be keep them, each other safe and how we interact with the public to make sure that both the public and our employees are safe during those interactions. So we do anticipate those protocols changing some uh, in, the, in the coming week. We're working on um, some facility plans to try and make that better, including uh, a remodeling project uh, downstairs to allow uh, for our customer interaction to take place from behind barriers uh, that can prevent COVID-19, again, to protect our employees and the public when they work with us, and improving our payment center, uh, again, to make sure that people are able to do business with us in, in a way without uh, have them having to worry about coming into contact um, with, with people that they don't regularly come in contact with. Uh, finally, um, one of the recommendations uh, that I made in the task force uh, adopted is that if we're going to encourage mask wearing, that, that the city, um, it would be appropriate for the city to buy masks to distribute to the public. And so I'm asking uh, for the city council as part of this emergency declaration to allow us to spend up to $200,000 to do that, um, to buy and distribute masks for free to our citizens. Um, I think any kind of uh, recommendation or mandate uh, to wear masks would probably be best accompanied by the, the ability to provide our citizens the masks to wear, um, I think. Um, we can use our emergency uh, funds for that in the wake of this emergency. I think it's likely to be reimbursed, a reimbursable expense. I, I can't guarantee that, but I think it's the right thing to do given uh, the, the dramatic healthcare costs that can result from having this disease. Uh, just preventing a few cases would more than cover that, that $200,000 um, that I'm, I'm asking us to be able to, to spend. Um, I do want to, before we get too far though into the recommendations, and forgive me for if I'm going a little too quickly, I do want to call our emergency manager, Tyler Evans, to come forward and then he'll introduce a few other, other uh, folks to give you information um, about what's going on in our community uh, before our uh, task force chair, uh, Orville Loge, will, will then uh, present to you as well. Mr. Mayor, members of council, in front of you, you should have the, uh, the data sheet I passed out earlier. I also sent this in the email earlier. Uh, for those watching online, if you go to the City of Muskogee Emergency Management page, uh, the same data that I'll be reading tonight is there in a uh, Facebook post. Uh, a couple of different pictures there, and this is the same sheet that we'll be following along here. Uh, and I won't read everything line by line. I'll hit the high points, and if there's any questions, uh, please feel free to ask them. And uh, as Mr. Miller said, we have some other speakers uh, from the Muskogee County Health Department and St. Francis on the line with us also that would like to speak. Um, I do want to put a disclaimer out there that uh, the Oklahoma State Department of Health uh, said that this is partial data for today, that they're missing some of the data for, uh, I believe it was Sunday and Monday. However, this data is different from Friday, so there has been an update on this data. How much of it is partial? That's a question I cannot answer right now, but this is updated data. But However, there's a disclaimer that uh, this was partial incomplete data, apparently that they're still gathering from yesterday. Uh, with that, we'll go ahead and continue and get into the, the data as far as uh, it's up to date as of now. Uh, there are currently 70 active cases in Muskogee County and 53 active cases in the city. The average age of death is 76 years of age. The average age of a hospitalization due to COVID is 61.2 years of age. The average age of a case not hospitalized is 38.5 years of age. The survival rate of all younger than age 50 is 99.87%. That's uh, calculated by taking the total deaths between zero through 50 years of age divided by the total cases of the same age group. This also includes the comorbidities of persons age zero through 50. For the state of Oklahoma, 20% of ICU beds are available, 24% medical surgery beds available, and 72% operating rooms are available. This is actually an increase from Friday. If you flip your sheet over. Mr. Evans, I don't mean to interrupt you. Yes, sir. Does that mean that more beds are available? Correct, not, statewide. Not more beds mean occupied, more, bed, more yes. beds are available. Yes, sir, this is the bed availability. Okay. And this is increased from Friday. I looked at my previous report Friday, comparing the two, and this has been an increase. So What's that suggests that fewer people are being admitted that would in be those areas. Correct, you can okay. make that judgment, yes, sir. Yes, what is that gap, what is that difference? from Friday to where you are now? Uh, I wanted to say, I'd have to go back and look, I want to say 16% of ICU beds I think were available Friday and 20% are available today. But ho don't hold me to it, it's a couple percentage points. It's not a huge percentage point, but it's a uh, improvement nonetheless. Thank you. We flip the, uh, the page older, uh, over, 
the total mortality rate of COVID-19 based on population. This is calculated by taking the total deaths divided by the population and bringing that to a percentage. The three columns there from left to right is for the state of Oklahoma, Muskogee County, and the city of Muskogee. Uh, for Muskogee County, it's 0.02%, and for the city, is 0.03%. The inverse of that will give you your survival rate of COVID-19 based on the population. For the city of Muskogee, is currently 99.97%. Couple columns down, uh, the total percent of active COVID-19 in population is calculated by taking the total cases uh, of COVID-19, subtracting the recovered and subtracting the deaths, divided by the population, bringing that to a percentage point. For the 53 active cases I stated that we currently have in Muskogee, the city of Muskogee, that would be a 0.143 percentage of active COVID-19 in the population. The inverse of that would be the total percent of population without COVID-19, which is 99.857% uh, that currently does not have COVID-19 in the city of Muskogee. With that, uh, if there are any questions with this, I'd like to address this first before uh, introducing our, our guest speakers. Are there any questions? Yeah, when you say 99%, that yes, almost give us uh, uh, the feeling like we don't really have any great concerns in Muskogee. Can you be more specific in that area? No, I, I don't want to say that look, there's... The yeah. numbers look good, but... Correct. So this is a different way to look at the data, correct? Okay. Uh, this is the same numbers I've been saying uh, ever since March. This is a, a broader way to look at how, what is the spread of COVID in our population? As I mentioned in you know earlier council meetings, I don't like coming here and saying, hey, our total rate is up to 230 cases, 240 cases, 250 cases, because that number never ever goes down, right? That's just mm -hmm. a cumulative number. So that number never gets smaller. The cumulative cases always gets bigger but I don't think that gives us a good idea of how is it affecting our community. I think it's a better understanding when I come up here and say we have 53 active cases in the community, right? Instead of okay. 200 and something, because 150 of those have already recovered. They're well, they're back to work. Uh, they don't have active COVID-19. So by putting it into a population, uh, like you said, 99.857% uh, of the city of Muskogee currently does not have active uh, COVID-19. Based on what numbers are testing, because a lot had not been tested. So is that really a concrete number that we can actually say? Can I just say this? I, I, I'm so afraid of this, this metrics. Okay. To me, myself, <clears throat> I hear where Tracy's going. Yeah. This, this is not helpful information to our community. <clears throat> like you're saying, these percentages of, of what's not here is not really what's important. What's important is that we have a problem. What's important is that we have a storm out on the ocean. So I, I think this is a decorated way that, uh, you know, could lead to a disastrous situation when it comes to COVID. We have COVID in Muskogee. 100%. There's lines, lines of people who line up every day that go in and, and get tested. In the next couple of days, all over the United States of America, we're seeing that the numbers are going up. So I, I'm sorry. I just, uh, this is a, I, I, I Mr. Reed, can I, can I ask how, how would you like the data presented? No, I'm, I'm just saying, uh, to me, this is, is a waste to tell us, you know, how many people don't have it right now today. Let's be straight up with the people of Muskogee and say, hey, we, we you know, uh, we need to talk about, you know, how serious this can become. So and I, I think that job, that's the subject that, you know, that's all over the nation. Right. not decorating it by saying, you know, a percentage of we have so many that don't have it today. Let's try to find a way to put uh, this, 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 I'm sorry, this just uh, rubs me the wrong way. So just the way with it's all due respect, it, it's, it's not my job to direct, decorate anything one way or the other. Uh, if you read this, the numbers are here. Uh, that's what's provided by the state. It's not I easy to understand the way you present it. I, I'm confused, so I can I, just imagine what people out there in the community, I'm sorry, that's just okay. where it took I, me. I, in, sure. in comments today, I, I'd sorry like to visit with you later on and uh, we'll get an idea of maybe a better presentation of how you would like the numbers presented. But at the end of the day, this is the numbers that's provided by the state. This is nothing that's made up by me. This is the numbers that are given in a percentage uh, based on the population. But I'd love to visit with anybody here uh, if they'd like to see the numbers in a different way. Like I said, these are numbers that are provided by the state. It's nothing that's made up by me. So if you want these presented in a different way, a different graph, a different chart, please visit with me and I'll make those graphs, charts, numbers available. Uh, and like I say, I'm not here to, to sway you one way or another. My job is to present you with data 
facts, and figures which I've presented to you. So if you'd like to see something different, please let me know. Are there any other questions? Ms. Uh, Evans, I think what would be helpful for uh, the whole council, uh, for example, if we were able to say Monday we had 15 cases, Thursday we've gone up to 20, but five have recovered. Mm -hmm. I think if it's something that, that yeah. simple, that would probably be, would help. Okay, uh, which that's all on the front page of this form here. Uh, the, the total number of confirmed cases for the city of Muskogee is 180. The total number recovered is 116. We've had 11 deaths in the city of Muskogee. That leaves the active cases as 53. So our baseline for all the data I think that we've been looking for is on the front page of this paper. All I've done is converted it into percentages, which I thought would, I've got a lot of good feedback ever since I started doing this last Monday. People said, hey, this is data we've never seen before. This is not what the media is portraying. I haven't seen this data. I have not seen these percentages. I've got a lot of good feedback from presenting this. If there's something else you'd like to see, please let me know so I can present it. That is my job. However, everything that you've asked for is on this piece of paper. What, what rate are we testing? What, what are our testing numbers? How many people have we tested? I know Doug's gonna come on. Yeah, but. it would be uh, better to ask Doug that. Okay. Uh, I mean, I, they're testing anywhere, I think, from 50 plus people every single day out there at the Muskogee County Health Department. Now with that, I mean, we still have at least four places in Muskogee, five including the hospital that you can be tested. Uh, Express Wellness, you can be tested there. Urgent Care, you can be tested there. The hospital's uh, not testing for the public, but if you're sick and go to the hospital. Uh, you can be tested at uh, DL DLO here in West Okmulgee as long as you have a doctor's note. So there's at least four places you can be tested at in Muskogee. Uh, I'm not sure if we're keeping the data, uh, the number of people tested by county. I know that data is available on the coronavirus website as far as how many test kits have been submitted. Okay. Uh, it also gives uh, the testing facilities and how many they've submitted also. Uh, but I can look into see if it's broke down by county. I know it's broke down by facility. So the numbers that you're giving us is based on what number of testing on these sheets here? So are, from these numbers, how many people can we say that actually has been tested? Uh, what would be your diagnosed cases? Uh, okay, so the 118? So the number of cumulative confirmed cases in the city of Muskogee is 180. So it's <laughs> positive results for the city of Muskogee. Okay, so we're saying 180 is our number? Currently, yes. That's very low for Muskogee. That's not a total test. That's just a, the confirmed positive Diagnosed, test. correct. Diagnosed and this goes all the way back to March since we started. This is that cumulative number I'm telling you about that will never, ever go down. It increases every week, right? Okay, I every time you. I come up here. But I guess what I'm trying to say, uh, of this number, how many people can we say total has been tested? Positive and negative. Yeah, positive, negative. Total number is what I'm asking. So the negative results, uh, the last time I checked was not reported back to the state. They were keeping track of the positive results. Okay. So the total number, I'm not sure that we have the data for that that the state is collecting, to be honest with you. Okay, thank you. That's, that's what I'm looking at, a total number. Thank yes, you. Yes, ma'am. I see what you're saying now. Mm -hmm. On the uh, number of reported deaths where you've got 14 in the county and 11 in the city, are those the same numbers? Yes, sir. So the 14 is the total, 11 of those were inside the city and four in the county? Yes, sir. And out of those 11, seven of those uh, unfortunately came from our long-term care facilities such as our nursing homes and assisted living facility. Okay. I'm happy with your numbers. It's a lot of information. I think the way you read it out might be a little bit confusing. Uh, I would like to know, do you have any idea of the number of multiples in the community that could I'm reading in other states, they're saying as high as 50 times the confirmed cases may be positive in the community. We're we talking Do about we that? have a rule of thumb. Oh, okay, so you're now talking about the as possible asymptomatic people that don't Correct. realize that they're sick. The I think what Tracy's asking is how many cases do we have total tested and are these numbers based on total tested numbers? I, I'm with you on that. What I'm curious of is do we in Oklahoma have a rule of thumb as to the number that we think are in the community untested that are positive. That's a really good question. I'm for hearing Doug, in to be honest other with states yeah. it's up to 50 times the number of confirmed cases. Sure. Uh, that's a good question for Doug. I guess kind of leaning toward the asymptomatic question also. I've been asking that for over a month, hoping to get what percentage of people in the population are possibly asymptomatic. Or actually what I was asking is the, the number of people tested that are not showing symptoms, right? 
you show up, you don't, you, you don't have symptoms, you simply want to be tested just to know, and you get a positive result back. Uh, so we either got to rule out false positives or we have to talk about uh, asymptomatic cases. Uh, I've been asking for that data for a while. They're just, they don't have it quite yet. Um, but that's something we can definitely ask uh, Mr. Walton from the health department on and hopefully he'll be able to shed some light on that. It's my observation that listening to your numbers that we have a 98, 99.8 plus percent survivable rate of known cases. Is that what you're telling me? Uh, so there's a different, different couple of different columns on there. Uh, survival rate of diagnosed cases, which is your third one down on the back page, mm -hmm. is 93.889 percent. That kind of ties into uh, the second one from the bottom, the mortality rate of those not in a long-term care facility, right? Because I said seven of the 11 came from a long-term care facility. Uh, so if you take out the long-term care facility numbers and you have diagnosed COVID-19 in the city of Muskogee, it's currently 97.778%. And if we were to factor in the unknown number which could be as high as 50 times the number of diagnosed cases, this would be 99.99999 from here to Tulsa and back? There, there's that possibility, yes, sir. Mr. Thank Mayor. Alex, point taken. <clears throat> well, Tyler, I don't envy your job. I mean, it's, uh, it's tough what you're doing, having to give these numbers, but just, uh, I don't wanna get too wrapped up in numbers because if a family comes to me and one's positive, three other wanna get tested, there's a time when we don't have a lot of tests available. So a lot of times we have to make the call, do we test or not? If they're healthy, they look good, we're probably not gonna test. Mm -hmm. Now that's changing because tests are becoming more available. So I don't wanna get too wrapped up on how many people have it and don't have it. What you're asking is how many asymptomatic data shows on that when we check antibodies, it's a lot lower than what we thought it would be. For people who went and had their antibodies drawn, they thought they had it in January, and it was negative. I mean, everybody's hearing that right now. So those are numbers that we'll have a better idea about. Since I've been sitting here, my phone's went off, uh, goes off all the time, but three different families all have positive tests just now. I mean, so it's in the county. I don't want to get too wrapped up either also on death rate and who's surviving, because most of us, if we do get this, we will do good. Some of us will not. Some of us that do go into the hospital and we survive, you're talking possibly up to three weeks of your life, plus going back out at home. You're not starting back over after that three weeks. And these are not just the elderly. These are people that are middle-aged also. Um, the numbers are really hard. You could take them either way. But I think as a community with what Mary Coleman said earlier that if we take the stance and we just try to be respectful of everybody else, wear a mask, social distance, wash your hands, we have a good chance of keeping it out of our county, out of our city from really blowing up because we're right there at the bubble. I mean, it's getting ready to happen. It's something that needs to be taken very seriously. Um, they said uh, uh, one of the deaths was actually a Muskogee physician. He's a really good guy. A lot of people probably don't know that. Mm -hmm. Very healthy. So it affects everyone differently. So I don't want people to think like, you know, well, only 1% do, does bad. Well, 2 out of 10 get hospitalized. Mm -hmm. Out of that, 1 out of 10 might be from the nursing home. The other one may not be. So we have to make sure that this is taken serious. And I appreciate, I, I like data, so I understand what you're saying. I, I can really go with what, what you're saying, but, um, and I appreciate it, but it's, it's really hard just to be able to come and take, because these numbers aren't fluid. I mean, it's moving by the moment. Mm -hmm. And I just uh, want to make sure that as, as the city and city leaders that we're doing what we can do to show that we care for other people also by making sure that we are social distancing, we are wearing masks, because if we don't wear masks, the likelihood of it progressing to, to forward to actually possibly shutting down businesses, it's, likely. it's, a, it's very likely. likely. And that's why they're asking to wear masks and to do these things so we don't go back to where we were in March and April, closing down our small businesses because, you know, those, those are our friends. Those are, that's our family. 
I'll turn the floor back over. And I want to also say, and Dr. Hoos, you can correct me if I'm wrong, I think part of the problem when we do try to analyze these numbers is the way that the state is providing them. You don't have to answer that, Mr., because I don't want you to put the state on the spot. But I'll go on a limb and say that a lot of cities and municipalities would probably be able to make better informed decisions if the state would report the numbers better than what they're doing right now. Sure. So, you know, what you see in front of you, I pull from three different sources. And right. there's 20 page reports out there, 30 page reports out right. there. So, my goal with this right here was to have an easy to read, uh, two page piece of paper that you could get an idea of where's Muskogee at, which is why I made the three columns, right? We can compare, mm -hmm. we can compare the city of Muskogee to the county. How's the county doing to the state? And the reason for the percentage is, like I stated earlier, when I come and say, hey, 180 people has had this. Okay, how bad is that for Muskogee? Let's put it into the community. How bad is that for our community? And that was a go with this. It's not to sway one people or another. As you said, there's no opinions on this. It's simply facts, figures, and numbers. And, and uh, Ty Tyler's using the numbers that he's getting. I mean, I know the numbers he's getting. He's, he's using those numbers, you know, and he's in it, and, and Doug, I know, is in it, and St. Francis is in it also. But, you know, I deal with it. I deal with it every day. So... I answer questions every day. I'm looking at data also every day. So, I mean, he's, he's giving the, he's being as objective mm -hmm. as he can. But sometimes this, with a disease process, objectivity is not always, you know, we try to be objective and try to be based off science, but we can't really predict which way it's going to go. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to a couple of speakers that we have. We'll start off with... Uh, Doug Walton from Muskogee County Health Department. Uh, yes, uh, hello, Tyler, um, Mayor and Council. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks for having me and, and having this discussion. Um, I really just try and add uh, what I can to what's already um, uh, been um, talked about. Uh, this evening really just uh, that we are seeing a continued uh, increase in the number of, of new cases. Um, looking at Muskogee County um, uh, to the week of Monday, uh, last week we've added 47 uh, new cases. Um, neighboring counties, just for reference, uh, Wagner County's added 88 new cases mm -hmm. since Monday of last week. Uh, Cherokee County 29, uh, Sequoia 21, Okmulgee 62 new cases. Uh, we've continued to do uh, daily um, testing at the Muskogee County Health Department. Um, last week, uh, Monday through Friday, we tested over 420. Um, and we've gotten most, uh, most of those results back looks like we've got from our testing um, and we actually are still la lacking the 17th so for the four days the 13th through the 16th um, we had uh, 26 positives um, out of the uh, let's see 420 less the Friday number one moment 342 that we collected Monday through Thursday. So one thing we've been watching kind of pretty carefully is the rates of positive uh, tests uh, for the testing that we're doing. I think I've reported in a previous meeting um, that all of the testing that we did prior to uh, June 1st from the beginning, uh, roughly 539 uh, samples collected. Um, we had from those that we had collected we had four positives that was a rate of 0.74 percent positive for the tests collected uh, since june 1st we've collected another roughly 786 uh, samples and our, our rate of positives is running at about 7.5 percent positive uh, so that is an indication to us that you know we are you know seeing an increasing rate of, of positive cases um, not just additional testing um, we'll continue to do the free testing at the health department uh, next week well through this week uh, Monday through Friday 8 30 to 10 30 
we hope to be continuing that next week as well. We have a large tent rented. Um, we're basically waiting to determine that we'll have enough sample kits available to do that. Uh, but currently it is available first come, first serve, um, ages 12 months and older, and no symptoms are required um, to, to have that uh, test drawn. Um, really just want to reiterate the the preventative side and the importance of wearing face coverings in public whenever in public, um, maintaining a distance of at least six feet from others, um, washing our hands frequently, especially uh, before and after eating or touching your face, um, and then uh, stay at home if you're sick, not feeling well, call 911 if you need immediate medical attention. Uh, I think that's about all I have to report. I'd be happy to take any questions. Mr. Walton, this is Mayor Coleman. Yes, sir. The question I have, you may not be able to answer, but do you believe that the county or the state health department, based on the numbers we have from Muskogee, can help articulate what a mask plan may actually look like if we have to phase one in? Uh, Perhaps maybe um, clarify just slightly what it, you're suggesting if because of the numbers that what what uh, what we would do about um, a plan for possibly mandating masks? Yes, in particular, a plan for what it would look like for Muskogee given our numbers because since the state does not do the best job at how the data is given to us, many municipalities have a tendency to do what another city did, but it's not based on their own data. So is it possible that the state or the county at that level can look at our numbers and uh, recommend to us what a mask policy would look like that fits our community? Right, right. Um, yes, I mean, I do think that that, I, I do believe that that would be, uh, you know, very doable. Um, I mean, I, I almost feel as though that um, that that level of specificity may not even be that necessary. I mean, I uh, I believe that the you know the um, recognizing the the trends of increasing cases and increasing rates of positive tests and and knowing that uh, face coverings reduce the spread um, within a community, you know, I mean, I, I almost feel like the, 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 enough of the basic uh, sort of foundation is, is present um, yes. in our community to, to kind of take it from there. Thank you. You're welcome. There's no other questions uh, for Mr. Walton, Muskogee County Health Department. I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Coons from uh, St. Francis. Does not sound like he's there. With that, uh, if there's no other questions for me, I'd like to turn the floor back over to Mr. Miller. Well, I, thank you guys. Um, I know that, yes, I think we would like to have uh, our district attorney and leader of our task force. Tish. Tish. Oh. Trish. Trish. I'm sorry. Mr. Chairman, uh, from, thank you. Thank you for, for reminding me from Muskogee County EMS and then, uh, then our district attorney. Thank you. Trish German, Muskogee County EMS. Um, little follow up on our um, water bill insert. I'll probably have something on your desk by Tuesday or Wednesday this week um, with the help with um, Health Department, Doug Walton, um, put something together so we can get that out to the public. People are still waiting way too long to go to the hospital, having that severe chest pain, that weakness, possible stroke type symptoms, diabetic calls, um, the high acuity of our um, emergency workers um, are taking these patients in emergency status so we've noticed a big big rise in that still we've uh, put something up on channel 14 um, telling people not to wait let's 
get out there, let's go to the hospital, call 911, and don't wait. Um, another thing is our transfers have increased a little bit. Um, I had, don't know the exact numbers on that. And again, we're just continuing our disinfecting um, our units, fogging them if we have a possible COVID patient, respiratory patient. So does anybody have any questions? Yes, Trish, uh, what, what do you think is the cause of the wait? Why do you think people are panicking to call? You know, back in March and April, you know, we forced it out there, Adam, saying don't go to the hospital, don't, you know, only go, only get out when, you know, you have to. So we really, really pushed that out. Now people are afraid and they're staying home, especially our elderly. Surprisingly, our elderly are staying at home. I don't think my mother-in-law has been out of the house since March. <laughs> you know, she has people deliver her stuff, set it on their porch. Um, she has, um, if she goes anywhere, it's through a fast food. She doesn't never get out of her car. So, you know, our elderly are staying inside like they're supposed to. So that's a lot of our problems is, you know, people need to call 911 if they're having a, a major medical problem. Thank Any you. Question? Thank you for your time. Mr. Mayor, uh, Council, uh, back in March, we formed the Joint Task Force with the city and county to address any issues related to COVID-19. Um, we've done a lot of work. Uh, we've made a lot of recommendations. Both the city council and the county commissioners have taken a lot of action in reference to this. We want to thank all of our community members for responding. We think that uh, the numbers that we have now, um, you know, they're always too much, but for what it could be and what we see in other cities, counties, and states, uh, I think we have to be thankful that over the course of this time from March, that uh, our numbers in response to what it could be are, are good. Now we're at the point where we have to decide uh, whether we have a mask ordinance. That's the hot topic with every um, leaders of cities and counties right now is do we enforce or mandate a mask policy? We met last Friday. We looked at everything. We, I gave everybody the floor to tell us what they think for or against. And uh, every member was still as serious about everything that we do as we were in March. Uh, we just weren't there yet. We, we don't think our community is there yet for a government to order a mask mandate. So we came up with the recommendation, as we have done before, to our community, to our, to our leaders, to recommend um, a mask policy. We recognize that businesses and governments, schools, um, there are different variables in their situation, in their buildings, with the number of people that come in, that we give them some, some flexibility. We have some schools getting ready to make some tough decisions uh, on opening schools and whether they enforce or have a mask policy. Um, we, we do not take this lightly at all. Everything that we do, um, we fully discuss everything. Every, every, we bring in all the data we have um, and discuss everything. And so we've come up with this recommendation to amend the resolution of recommending to our community, again, respond, uh, to come up with just a mask policy. You may do it and you may not but we want you to recognize what's going on and, and uh, you take Walmart, for example. I'm glad they did. I'm glad they come up with a mask policy. For one reason, it's a nationwide, and we have a nationwide company telling nationwide, take this serious. And this is our approach right now. You come into our business and you shop, we want you to be wearing a mask in response to COVID-19. That says a lot. And so 
we make this recommendation to you, but we also understand, we know where, where cities and counties are coming from that do order uh, or make an order for masks. Um, a lot here, there's, there's no right and wrong. There is, let's do the best we can for our community. And that's kind of where we're at right now. Questions for Mr. Loge? Orville, so your recommendation is for not mandate, but ask everybody to be respectful of others and wear masks. Yes. Some data came out about mandates in cities just kind of, of, of not only, it does come with its own set of, of problems too, and with enforcing it, how we put our officers in certain situations where hopefully they wouldn't need to be into, and, um, you know, with other uh, businesses where, you know, everyone's seen it, where they walked in and got really angry at the business owner, and, but um, what they've, sh what this, the studies are kind of leaning towards is that a strong recommendation and then with the private sector doing what Walmart and, and other chains are doing is showing a really good benefit and um, hopefully will curb us the need to mandate because there are some pretty significant problems that some of these other communities were having. So, so Roy, do you want to read the our amended portion of the resolution from the task force? happy to. Um, this was uh, uh, emailed out to all of you and it, for those at home, is on our website uh, under the uh, heading of news. So we did include a copy of that. So this would be the third amended uh, resolution number 2803. Um, the uh, major substance of the uh, amendment is the addition of a section F. Uh, which basically will say, based upon findings of the CDC and the Muskogee City County Health Department, the use of face coverings measurably reduce the spread of COVID-19 from those who are infected. This is particularly important since many of those infected show none of the symptoms commonly associated with the disease yet remain contagious. Due to, the due to the responsible mitigation efforts of our businesses and the diligence of our citizens, Muskogee County remains in the low risk infection category, according to the data of the State Health Department. Notwithstanding, the city and county find that uh, additional efforts are necessary to decrease the upward trend of infection rates within the low risk category. Therefore, the following guidance shall remain in effect during the pendency of phase three of the governor's hours plan. One, all citizens are strongly encouraged to wear face coverings in accordance with CDC guidelines. When out in public or entering a place where there are or are expected to be individuals outside their family unit or household. Two, businesses are encouraged to implement and enforce their own rules, regulations, or policies with respect to mandating face coverings for employees, customers, or patrons. Three, the city and county through the city county joint task force shall continue to monitor infection mortality and hospitalization trends and will make necessary modifications to this resolution as may be necessary Four, the city manager of the city is hereby empowered and directed to utilize emergency funding up to two hundred thousand dollars for the purchase of face coverings for any citizen within the city who requests one to the extent necessary to comply with this mandate the city's purchasing policy shall be suspended so that represents the modifications uh, for the uh, third amended uh, resolution 2803 uh, on behalf of the uh, Joint City County Task Force. Okay, why is it time? Is it time? I'll move to amend the proposed City of Muskogee Third Amendment Resolution number 2803 by replacing subsections F as follows. Would be honest if I explain something right quick, Roy. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Myself, up here personally, our kids are getting ready to go back to school. And when they go back to school, they're gonna have these they're gonna have masks on. And we as a community and as adults, we need to set an example for our children. Because until it actually hits you and hits your home, we have no clue. I'd rather have this mask on any day. This, this is the N95 than a tube down my throat on a ventilator. 
it don't hurt to go places. I, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of Walmart, like Mr. Lodge said. I'm proud of Walmart that they went to uh, ha having people come in their facilities. And other places businesses here in Muskogee. This mask will not hurt anybody. It will help us. My mask is protecting Councilman <coughs> Reynolds over here. His mask is protecting me. Same thing with Dr. Who's. These masks do work. They help you. And so a couple of weeks ago, you're talking about you want to help our city. I was at Hot Hat Box driving by. All these little kids. I mean, we made money. But all these kids out there just wasn't no social distancing. I mean, wow, just everybody around everybody. But when you, somehow I bet you, some people went home with that virus. I feel sorry for those little kids. I was looking on the news. I know the news ain't Muskogee. But even babies are getting it now. Little babies are getting COVID-19. Mm -hmm. So we need to do something here in Muskogee to protect our citizens and ourselves and this mask here is not going to hurt anything. And I was talking to Roy about it, and I'll let Roy explain about the fines, which we're not trying to find anybody. Am I correct, Roy? We're just trying to make people aware to put this on, because it can save your life. Because COVID-19 is here, and we all know it's here. And I'm, 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 trying to, I'm, going, to try, I'm going to say this out of love. Please don't take, take offense to it. Because when I come up here and talk, people always tell me, oh, he's so mean. He's so mean. I'm not trying to be mean, and I try to be respectful. But everybody in this room should have a mask on for our protection, everybody's protection in here. So I am definitely for mandating as a councilman in War Three, and helping my constituents and helping the citizens of Muskogee. I'm not scared to say I, I, I'm all for mandating wearing a mask. Because CVS, that's another one. I watched the businesses before I came today on TV. That's Mandates, you can't come in a facility unless you got masks. That's a great idea the city of Muskogee want to buy people masks. I commend that. I commend the city of Muskogee for that. That's a great idea. So go ahead, Mr. Tucker. Uh, Councilor Van, um, his motion to uh, uh, amend the proposed resolution includes a modification of Section F. Uh, and I will go through this as well. Uh, based upon the findings of the CDC, some of the language is the same, and the Muskogee City County Health Department, the use of face coverings measurably reduced the spread of COVID-19 from those who are infected. Uh, again, this is particularly important since many of those infected show no, none of the symptoms commonly associated with the disease, yet remain contagious. In an effort to reduce the upward trend of our new infections and understanding the significant consequences, a rollback of the governor's hours plan would mean for the economic stability of the city, the City Council of the City of Muskogee find that mandating face coverings be worn in accordance with the provisions therein, herein represents the least restrictive means of reducing the spread of the COVID-19 infection. Therefore, the following guidance shall remain in effect during the pendency of phase three of the governor's hours plan. Number one, all persons shall wear face coverings when entering and while inside any indoor place open to the, to the public or in any indoor location where, excuse me, or in any outdoor location where maintaining a social distance of at least six feet is impractical. Face covering shall mean a uniform piece of material that securely covers a person's nose and mouth and remains affixed in place without the use of one's hands and or a face shield. Face covering should fit snugly but comfortably against the side of the face and allow for breathing without restriction. Nothing herein, this is number two, shall require the wearing of face mask coverings as contemplated above for the following persons. A, persons who fall within the CDC guidance for those who should not wear face coverings due to medical or mental health condition or developmental disability. B, children under 18. C, restaurant patrons while they are <coughs> eating and drinking. D, persons exercising in communal outdoor spaces or persons walking or exercising with other persons from the same household in communal outdoor spaces as long as physical distancing is maintained. Persons congregating in communal outdoor spaces with others not in their same household are required to wear, face, uh, wear a face covering when physical distancing is not being maintained. E, a setting where it is not practical or feasible to wear a face mask, such as dental services and medical treatment or while swimming. F, occupants in a personal vehicle, personal office, or similar private space while other persons outside the person's household are not present. 
uh, G, private homes, H, offices and workplace where members of the public are not generally allowed and where physical distancing between employees and other occupants can be consistently maintained during the hours of operations. Three, there is no specific penalty for violation of this mandate. However, persons refusing to wear face coverings shall be subject to prosecution under criminal trespass, disturbing the peace, disorderly conduct, or other similar offenses as circumstances warrant. Four, uh, the city manager of the city is hereby authorized and directed to utilize emergency funding in an amount not to exceed 200,000 for the purchase of face coverings for any citizen within the city who requests one. To the extent necessary to comply with this mandate, the city's purchasing policy shall be suspended. All right, so to clarify, uh, the task force has recommended uh, modifications to 2803. Uh, Councillor Van, by his uh, motion, seeks to supplement what the task force has recommended with what I have just read. And so, Councillor Van has made that motion. If there is a second, then the, and it is uh, voted on uh, by at least a majority of you, then the uh, amendment at 2803 will include the language that I just read, which is the mandatory uh, mask face covering uh, the face covering mandate with the exceptions that are articulated. If that motion fails, then another motion could be made to adopt the recommendations as presented by the task force. So there you have it. Have to answer any questions. Thank you, Roy. Mm -hmm. Mr. Van has made a motion. Uh, I will ask if there's a second. Second. We have a motion and a second. Do we have any further discussion or questions? Uh, I have a question. So. At this time, if a business says you must wear a face mask, so my business, Representative Councilman Reynolds' business, says you have to have a face mask to come in, someone chooses to not do that, and we ask them to leave, would they still be bound by the trespassing? Yes. Okay. If someone comes, like for example, Walmart or either of your businesses, you mandate a mask either... Um, uh, under either protocol, because we're talking about private businesses, right. to mandate a mask, you t the person says, no, I'm not going to wear one, you say leave, and they refuse, then they can be charged with criminal trespass. Okay. And that's on either one, right? That's correct. Okay. So is there going to be an enforcement mechanism or not? In the resolution, there is not an enforcement mechanism. Um, if we decided that there was going to be an enforcement mechanism, then I think this needs to be uh, turned into an ordinance. Um, in looking at what the guidance has been so far, I did a survey uh, that I emailed out to everybody looking at uh, the comparison between Tulsa and Oklahoma City's ordinance uh, as well as well as what other cities in our area have done. Um, Oklahoma City's penalty is... Uh, uh, first offense is a warning, uh, excuse me, the first contact is a warning, the first offense is $9, the second offense is $9, the third and subsequent offense is $100, and that's for the city of Oklahoma City. For Tulsa, there was no penalty. I looked for other cities, uh, Edmond uh, strongly encourages but not, does not mandate mask coverings. Norman mandates uh, masks, and they provide exceptions similar to Tulsa and Oklahoma City. Uh, they too, like what are, is being proposed under both the recommendation from the task force and Councilor Van, um, did allocate funding to buy masks for their citizens. Uh, Yukon uh, mandates masks only for bar employees, restaurant food service employees, and those entering city buildings. No general mask mandate. Uh, Stillwater does have a mask mandate. They provide the sem same exceptions like Tulsa and Oklahoma City does and which uh, has been incorporated in Councilor Van's uh, amendment. Uh, there is no fine, but could similarly subject someone to trespass, disturbing the peace, which is similar to the Tulsa ordinance. Bartlesville strongly encourages use of masks but does not mandate. Lawton mandates masks while in a commercial entity or public building or space open to the public or mass transit. It provides similar exceptions to Tulsa and Oklahoma City. Uh, there is a required warning first, and then the fine is $100. Stillwell, masks are discretionary. 
Owasso strongly encourages the use of masks but does not mandate. Broken Arrow strongly encourages but do does not mandate. Jinx strongly encourages but does not mandate. Enid strongly encourages but not, does not mandate. Midwest City strongly encourages but does not mandate. Tahlequah has no mandate, but the proposal was on their agenda for tonight. Uh, and then McAllister uh, also has no mask mandate. So that's additional information based upon uh, the survey that we did. So uh, effectively, Mayor, to answer your questions, it's whatever the council wants to do because the guidance from the cities has been some fine, some do not fine. Mr. Miller, my question is, if we were to go this path on tonight, when will we have masks? Because my concern is, if there's a mandate with no mask available mm -hmm. without enforceability powers, you know, what, so, what? So we carried forward the recommendation Friday and we started working on that Friday. We don't have an answer. We don't have a vendor lined up for the quantity of masks. Um, as of you know, five o'clock today, as of 5.30 when this meeting started, I can't give you that answer. We're trying to figure out uh, as quickly as possible that we can get a large quantity of masks. And we've got uh, reached out to several vendors and they're getting back to us. But I couldn't tell you today how soon. I appreciate uh, what's trying to be done on tonight. My only concern is that if we were gonna pursue this type of recommendation, which is stronger than what the task force is recommending, it's hard to wrap my mind at least around today without having all the data that we need to be able to do it. Uh, as Councilor Reed has, has expressed earlier, um, and to a large extent I do agree, um, not that we were given wrong information by our staff, but that the state has been so slow um, to pass down information in a way that local municipalities can make an informed decision based on their area. Um, and if I was gonna vote for a policy, I would want that information so that we can articulate our policy to the needs of Muskogee. And the challenge for all of us on the council is that we don't have good information. Um, and that's not a bad reflection on our staff. They're doing everything they can with what they have, as uh, Councilor Hoos has said, uh, but they're not giving it to us in a way where as a council we can make that uh, informed decision. And then to, um, you know, if we were gonna do a policy, I would want to know how it was gonna be enforced because my fear, and I've expressed this in the task force meeting, and I don't mean uh, to be funny or cute, but without an enforceability clause, we're gonna create Karens and Kevins uh, in Muskogee. Um, which is what we don't need, because then we're not fighting COVID, we're fighting each other. And so I just would really like, personally, uh, and I'm, I'm willing to call a special call meeting as early as Friday if we need to address it again, uh, to have that information, uh, to have that uh, policy information that's specific to our needs uh, so that we can make a better decision uh, for our residents, and that's just my opinion. I mean, of course, everybody else on this Diaz, I respect theirs, um, but those are my concerns. Mr. Mayor, about we recognize? Yes. I understand your concerns, Mayor Colby, but we as a council, we're up here tonight, I mean, we're not on council, but we, we're, this is a committee, mm -hmm. but we, we, can, we can still talk about like the enforcement of it, if you want to put the enforcement on it, you know, it's just, you know, it's up to the, uh, the committee here. Just you know. to clarify, we're in special session of city council. Oh, that's right, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sorry. We've been here long, man. You so are my time. I've been here a long time. He's done all of <laughs> anyway, we're here, in we're here at the city council, and the council is the one that <coughs> makes the recommendation. So I don't see what's not wrong without. If we want something in, the, you know, in stone, why can't we do it tonight? We're here. If we want something really in stone and people agree with what I'm saying, we definitely need these, this, this mandate to protect our citizens. Let's get it done. We're here. Why well, we gotta wait till Friday? We're here. This is the council. You know? Because like I said, this is, this is serious. Just say, for example, my child had it. And they were in the hospital. Your mother had it. Everybody's kin people up here, and every, all this room had it. 
we would be looking at this thing very differently. Because when it comes to your house, it's a different story. Right. And looking at somebody else's on TV and looking at videos on uh, YouTube. You know, this is serious. You know, we, we need to make a decision on doing the right thing. And that's all I'm about, is doing the right thing. Not trying to be mean to our citizens, trying to protect our citizens. That's it, that's all I ask. When I open my mouth up here, like I say, I try to think of my family, my citizens, our council, everybody in here. It's just, it's safety. I'm telling you, this, this COVID is real. I know people that got it, it's real. It's just real, uh, Mayor Coleman. I turn the floor back up to you. Yeah. Mr. Mayor, am I very recognized? Yes. Um, I strongly suggest that we adapt the Joint Council's recommendation of strongly suggesting that we wear a mask and then please observe the business's rules that you're going into. Um, it's going to be extremely difficult for us to mandate mandatory masks. I myself have been looking for masks for my employees. I could care less what they cost or where they come from, and I absolutely can't get them here. To tell everyone that they have to have them is, is not going to be enforceable. We may or may not have some coming to the city that we can provide, but we have no ability to mandate that. We have no ability to follow up on that. I absolutely, when someone comes into my business and they're not wearing a mask, I'm not going to argue and fight with them. I will not call the police on them. That is a waste of our time, and we should not spend any more time in mandating something like that. We need to strongly suggest that we do that, follow the council's or the joint task force deal, and I do suggest we follow Councilor Van's move tonight and that we vote for that and that we move forward now with strongly suggesting that we do. I second the task force motion. There but we have well, a, we, we would have to a vote. motion and a second on the floor, so we need to take Van's that vote. original motion, yep. Yep. which I would ask you to vote no on. Let me so. just ask a question. Um, you're saying that the city's going to allow two hundred thousand dollars to get some masses, whether you go with the task force or you go with the recommendation of Mr. Van. It's the same outcome. You have, you don't have it. So to that point, Alex, I think that says right there, you don't have <laughs> the masses. People should be wearing masses anyway. I mean, I'm just saying, you should, you should be wearing masses. And I don't know if you guys read the Muskogee Phoenix, but on Saturday and Sunday paper that came out on July the 18th, 19th, and 20th, there was a commentary in there by Miss Holly Miller. I recommend that you read it. It may help the council up here be a little bit more open to others. Um, it's obvious that uh, this may not have touched some of us personally to um, just be so candid to uh, say, let us do as we will to do. Uh, we say that we recommend, we take our recommendation from the CDC, and I think most of y'all know what the CDC is saying right now, correct? It's telling you to wear a mask. It's telling you to distance yourself. It's telling you to wash your hands. That's what he's saying. And when I look up on this council, you got a mask on, Alex. You got a uh, mask on, Mr. Van. Mr. Hoos, you got a mask on. You got a mask on, Derek. You got a mask on, Mayor Coleman. These ladies don't have a mask. I have a mask on. You look out here, you do a, do, just do a little sample. Most people got a mask on. So if you're going to be a leader, we should lead. Council so I'm saying, please read that article that she wrote. Council McGee, may I be recognized, Mr. Yes. Mayor? Sorry. You have that article? I have it here. Could you read it for us, please, if the, if, if the mayor allows it? That's fine. Yes, pass it down to Tracy. Would you read that for us, please? It may help us. This is the longest year in living memory, and we are barely halfway through it. I looked back at my first column of 2020 and thought to myself, who is this optimist? And really, it wasn't so much optimistic as to call it optimism, a call for us to look beyond the face we see reflected back in the mirror, a call to be the seekers of truth in these harrowing days of alternative facts, and let's face it, outright lies. But even with all we've been through as a nation these past several years, I think what has got me mentally pinned to the floor the last few weeks 
is the willful ignorance about science coupled with the refusal of so many to do something small to help others in their airspace slash proximity. Wear your mask. Just freaking wear it. Why not take this small step for a few weeks and see how, see how we fare? In the last 14 days, I've had a healthy friend hospitalized with COVID-19, another friend who has multiple family members sick with it, and several other friends who have been exposed and are awaiting the dreaded test results. These folk, folks are in our town and don't include my friends around the country who are mourning loved ones who have died already. School starts in less than a month. I'm neither a panicky nor particularly feel fearful person, but it's not lost on me that the likes of Michael Cohen and Paul Manafort and many prisoners around the country got released from prison due to coronavirus concerns. Yet we are going to send our babies and beloved teachers back into crowded classrooms. And yes, I understand we have options. I, more than many, have every option available to me. I am confident our local school officials are doing their best, and God bless them. But that doesn't make it any less stressful or heartbreaking because there is just no win if things keep moving along the current trajectory. I guess that's why I'm simmering with rage and keep waking up at 3.37 a.m. The CDC and the Surgeon General both said this past week that if Americans would wear masks when in public, we could get this epidemic under control in four to eight weeks. Do I enjoy wearing a mask? No, but I also don't enjoy wearing a bra. Yet I do it out of respect for all of you and have every day since I was 11. I promise the mask won't hurt you and also masks don't have an underwire. Fellow Okies from Muskogee, I implore you to remember that we live in community. <coughs> when you mask up in public, you're protecting others by keeping your spray to yourself. If we all do this one simple thing, then perhaps we can come out the other side of COVID less scathed. Holly Rosser Miller has lived and worked in Muskogee for 18 years. That right there says something. You let people out of prison that done wrong because of this virus. What is the world coming to? Very good one. That tells the truth. So that give you something else up here to think about, Council. Really does. Don't look at it as if Ivory Van, the councilman, brought this item. Look at it. Your family brought it to you and had to make the decision. Don't look at it because of me. Because I know I'm telling you the truth. And I'm doing, trying to be as fair as I can and honest as I can. This is very, very important. This bowl right here, you can shove it, you can shove it to like, you can shove it to the curb. But that's not going to take away COVID 19. Like Donald Trump said, Oh, it'd be gone. It's a miracle. It's going. It's going to be leaving you. Just like that. Go ain't be here. But it's still here. And it ain't over yet. Turn the floor back over you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion to call for question. Motion to call for question. That means we're going to vote with no more discussion. Second. Second. Mr. Tucker, read the motion and we're going to vote. Uh, the motion would be. Did we wear the battery smooth out, Bruce? You know how Roy is. <laughs> right. Okay. So, uh, Mayor Council, uh, the motion would be to amend the proposed City of Muskogee third amended resolution 2803 by replacing subsection F as follows. And that was the section that I read relating the mandated, uh, mandating of masks with no penalty for not wearing one. Roll call. Tracy Hoos? No. Tracy McGee? Yes. Stephanie Morgan? No. Alex Reynolds? No. Evelyn Hibbs? No. Jamie Stout? No. Ivory Van? Yes. Deputy Mayor Derek Reed? Yes. Mayor Marlon Coleman? No. The motion fails. Motion fails. We still have for discussion the motion, uh, the recommendation that's been presented by the task force. I move that we adopt the task force as read by Roy as brought to us by 
Uh, Mr. Loge. I second. We have a motion and a second. Further discussion? Roll call. Tracy Hoos? Yes. Tracy McGee? No. Stephanie Morgan? Yes. Alex Reynolds? Yes. Evelyn Hibbs? Yes. Jamie Stout? Yes. Ivory Van? No. Deputy Mayor Derek Reed? No. Mayor Marlon Coleman? Yes. Motion passes. Let me say before we go on to the next item that to all of our residents, certainly we don't pass anything lightly. And so we will take into consideration everything that we need to do going forward. If any necessary amendments are necessary to maintain our safety. And Mayor, uh, one other thing I would just uh, suggest that maybe you clarify what the action of the council was. Can you read Since that? there were two competing actions, why just to you, clarify. Why don't you read that? Sure. Um, so effectively, um, the recommendation of the uh, C County Joint Task Force was adopted, which provides an amendment to 2803, which, which uh, say, states that all citizens are strongly encouraged to wear face coverings in accordance with CDC guidelines when out in public or entering a place where they are or are expected to be individuals outside their family unit or household. Businesses are encouraged to implement and enforce their own rules, regulations, or policies with respect to mandating face coverings for employees, customers, and patrons. The city and the county through the joint, uh, excuse me, the city and the county through the city county joint task force shall continue to monitor in infection, mortality, and hospitalization trends and will make necessary modifications to this resolution as may be necessary. The city manager of the city is hereby authorized and directed to utilize emergency funding up to $200,000 for the purchase of face coverings for any citizen within the city who requests one. To the extent necessary to comply with this mandate, the city's purchasing policy shall be suspended. Those are the requirements uh, of the recommendation that the council did adopt. Um, after the meeting, we will uh, make sure that those, uh, that cleaned up language is posted uh, and available for viewing. Thank you, Mr. Tucker. Yes. That will bring to a conclusion the special call meeting. We'll now call to order the meeting of the Muskogee Municipal Authority. Roll call. Mayor Mar Marlon Coleman. Here. Deputy Mayor Derek Reed. Here. Ivory Van. Here. Jamie Stout. Here. Evelyn Hibbs. Here. Alex Reynolds. Here. Stephanie Morgan. Here. Tracy McGee. Here. Tracy Hoos. Here. Item number one. Consider approval of resolution number 2823 authorizing the Muskogee Municipal Authority to issue its sales tax revenue note, series 2020, in the aggregate principal amount of $6,826,000, waiving competitive bidding and authorizing the note to be sold on a negotiated basis, approving and authorizing the execution of a sales tax agreement by and between the City of Muskogee, Oklahoma, and the authority pertaining to a year-to-year -year pledge of certain sales and use tax revenue, approving and authorizing execution of note indenture authorizing the issuance and securing the payment of the note, providing that the organizational document creating the authority is subject to the provisions of the note indenture, establishing the authority's reasonable expectation with respect to the issuance of tax-exempt obligations by the authority in calendar year 2020, and designating the note as a qualified tax-exempt obligation, approving and authorizing the execution of an escrow deposit agreement, authorizing and directing the execution of the note and other documents relating to the transaction, and containing other provisions relating thereto, and take other necessary action. Mr. Miller. Yes, this is the uh, third agenda item that I talked to you about that we would have three. This allows us to actually uh, borrow the money and uh, it lets us get those projects started and kicked off. It's a, a day we've all been looking forward to. Um, you have before you uh, the bid tabulation sheet um, from the interest rate uh, offers that we received. Um, did our friend Ben have to leave, Nate, or uh, he had to step out, he, he in, the step out in the hallway? So. Um, uh, Nate Ellis is with our bond council and Ben Oglesby, who was here uh, earlier and is, is uh, maybe just out in the hallway. Uh, as for our financial advisor, we do um, recommend taking the, um, the lowest interest rate uh, uh, bid that was proposed, which is 1.57% um, uh, for the uh, term of this note. Um, uh, that's a very good interest rate. Uh, I think that really is, uh, gives us a good leg up to get these projects started. 
Uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions that I can answer, and uh, Mr. Ellis is here as well. Uh, and if we need Mr. Oglesby, I bet we can go find him if we have to. But we do recommend approval, and we're happy to answer any questions. Move for approval. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Do we have any questions or discussion? Roll call. Tracy Hoos. Yes. Tracy McGee. Yes. Stephanie Morgan. Yes. Alex Reynolds. Yes. Evelyn Hibbs. Yes. Jamie Stout. Yes. Ivory Van. Yes. Deputy Mayor Jarek Reed. Yes. Mayor Marlon Coleman. Yes. The uh, item passes, and with that, we Mr. are adjourned. Mr. Coleman, before you adjourn, I just I think it probably uh, probably just for the record, we do need to state that that was from uh, Bank of Oklahoma. Um, and let the, just the, that is the the rate that you were approving. I think I may have just mentioned the the the. Uh, um, the percentage rate, but I do need to make sure that we, you guys know who we're borrowing it from. So I just want to include that in the record. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're adjourned.